All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the March 5th, 2019 Council Committee meeting. My name is Stephanie Meyer, Council President and a Council Member from Ward 3, and I will be chairing this meeting. Besides myself, the committee members here tonight are Matt Zimmerman, Ward 1, Jim Neighbor, Ward 1, Eric Jenkins, Ward 2, Mike Kemling, Ward 2, Lisa Larson Bunnell, Ward 3, Mickey Sandifer, Ward 4, and Lindsay Constance, Ward 4. Before we begin our agenda, I'd like to explain our procedures for public input. During the meeting, I will offer the opportunity for public input. If you would like to speak to the committee at any of those times, please go to the podium. I will ask that you state your name and address for the record, and then you may offer your comments. So that members of the audience can hear you, I would ask that you speak directly into the microphone. By policy, comments are limited to five minutes, and after you are finished, please sign the form on the podium to ensure we have an accurate record of your name and address. There are two items on tonight's agenda. The first is a discussion of the water tower logo. Water District Number One is constructing a water tower next to Public Works Service Center at 18690 Johnson Drive. Staff is seeking direction on what, if anything, should be painted on the tower. City Manager Nolan Sunderman will make a presentation. Welcome, Nolan, or you'll kick it over. <laughs> All right, Doug Whitaker, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Knock on wood. <laughs> right. It's been kind of bored. <laughs> uh, surely not. All right, about that. Okay, Doug Whitaker, Public Works Director. As you know, the water tower has been out there under construction. Um, basically, there to appoint the contractor is my service center manager, usually at every construction meeting they have, so that we have a lot of good communication out there with them. And they're at that point where they need to kind of know where we would like to head with the signage or logo on the tower as they need to start making plans for it. So I just brought tonight, first of all, just there's a couple of drone pictures here of where it's at. This was the first part of February. Um, that's the main tube. I think it's about 60 foot in diameter. That's uh, each one of those lines, if you look, is about four foot tall as they poured the concrete walls. And they, as you can see here, this picture was taken today out there. They are at the, the concrete tube is done. So it is only about 35 to 36 feet tall. So that's the maximum. However, the tower is about, or excuse me, the tank is about 70 feet tall. So it'll be right around 105, 110 feet tall when it gets done. So as you, so these are basically, here's some suggestions is what we could do on the tower. And again, we're just showing you, they did some renderings for us uh, just to present. We go from there, but you can kind of see the, in perspective, the little, the tube part uh, is not that tall compared to the overall tank. So it's not going to be sticking way up in the air because we're already at fairly high, whatever you want to call it, elevation out there because of the uh, landfill and where we are on the hill. So this is one with the standard good starts here, Shawnee logo on it. And again, the overall bowl, as you see up top there, is goes about, what, 116 feet wide. So it goes from the tube is 60 feet in diameter and it'll go out to about 116 feet. It, this one, and for those, I don't know whether you know, I know not to bore you, but this one is supposed to hold 3 million gallons, so that's why it's, it's the biggest water tower they have. This is one with uh, the seal on it. Another one is just plain Shawnee on it. Water One, which I think is what's on their tower down at uh, at their headquarters down there in Renner Road. And then here's one with just maybe some sports figures on it. As far as from the staff perspective, we've talked some just not again, doesn't make any difference to us, so don't take this. But the only issue we have with putting Shawnee on the tower is right now they think we are the water company. You don't know how many calls Public Works gets that, hey, my water's out of service, the water line's broke, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't, you know, that's the only thing with Shawnee on it is, is it could, you know, push it towards calling us. So. Mickey. But in a lot of cases, uh, the residents call the city on utilities anyway because they don't, they don't know who to call. So they call the city and get 
reference to or phone numbers to help enact what they're going to do. Uh, it, what I what I like to, to see in like on the water tower, Shawnee's known for we're we're kind of a, getting to be a big city, but we have the small city atmosphere, and to have our name on a water tower kind of keeps that small city atmosphere to me, and it would be cool, just to that you know that's what we focus on that's what people move to Shawnee for, is that hometown feeling that they get, and I would like to try to, if, if at all possible, try to continue it. Lake Quivera had their, their water tower out there until the water company, Water One gave them enough power to where they didn't need a water tower to push the, the pressure. There said Quivera Lake right on it. You know, everybody has their name on their water tower. You know, and as, as, as for the city, you know, everybody thinking it belongs to the city. They think all the utilities belong to the city. They call in now, all the time. Every time they have an issue, they call the city first. Then they find out the city has nothing to do with it and they get directed where they need to go. But, you know, she had a beautiful idea of, you know, we were talking about some type of, of, of uh, design because of all the sports fields. Can you put up that one? Right, she had, yeah, I know. I see what you're saying there. That's that like that there and then put, this, put Shawnee on it, you know. And to clarify, <laughs> what I was looking at with this, was we were talking about maintenance costs, if we were to go towards a mural kind of design, which I know has been suggested. And I really, really love the idea of actually incorporating some public art and having Welcome to Shawnee. So I was really drawn to the sports motif. Now, I don't love the photograph here, but what I wanted to point out is if cost was a concern, you can do this sort of wrap idea where it would be less maintenance potentially but i of course don't know what the costs are but i have to say i i would love to be able to work with some local artists to be able to design what the design will be um in sporting yeah and yeah. i i, I love the idea of the sports motif to highlight that area okay. Steph. Yeah, uh, Matt and then Lindsay and Doug, did you have any presentation left before we dive into No, the discussion? only thing I had was just, let me just, maybe you can flip sure. back, is let me, oops. Yes, either or. Yeah. The only one we wouldn't pay for is Water One. No joke. They should pay for it. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> That's a good question. Are, yeah, they're charging us. I think unless we leave water one on it, I don't want to leave water one on it. Where it would go, and this is just just so that you know, it's it's up to. It says it will have the water one logo. This was in the contract. However, the general manager of water one and the city manager can agree on a different. You know, so I just wanted to know what the process is to work with water one. I just threw this in. This is what's in the contract language that we signed. Yeah. You know, I think if it's just a standard logo up there, that Water One would pay for it. If we go into <coughs> you know the the artwork and and all of that, then that would be a different thing. Well, we don't know that for sure it. because I don't we know haven't for asked sure, that question. But we'd have that would have to be negotiated with them, so we wouldn't know where it would go. Mm -hmm. I think we have a couple questions on deck, Matt, and then Lindsay, and then maybe Nolan first. Yeah. I just want to, uh, Councilmember Jenkins' comment, um, appreciate the comments. The only thing I would say is there has been some conversation amongst some of the council. It's come up, I think we've had it as a kind of unmet need the, the last few years in the budget as there's been some discussion of updating our logo or changing the good starts here at some point. So whether that happens two years from now or 10 years from now, just that's something that that could change as well as there's there has been some conversation that might be about. an idea just put shawnee yeah i see what you're saying mm -hmm. okay yeah if we do so, that if we do change the logo let's uh instead of paying somebody to tell us what our logo is why don't we hire why don't we get the folks at shawnee to put the other logo for us this time and have a citywide um open deal everybody just put in their ideas for a new logo for shawnee i think that'd be great and it'd be um citizen driven and wouldn't cost twenty five thousand dollars so that would be nice Matt. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm thinking, 
the location of the water tower is uh, is very close to where we have a lot of uh, parks and rec activity that in the future Valley of Champions. Um, the, the landfill has been, we've had a lot of conversations about landfill ultimately going to parks and rec, that whole area going to public service. And, and we even had issues with, with the recent um, eminent domain uh, with that one area. At some point, that's all going to be parks and rec. It's going to be sort of that Valley of Champion thing. And I, I really like the idea of, of leveraging that, that, whether it's that mural that you showed us, Doug, or, or something that, that Lisa was, I, I think we need to capture that. And, and that, that becomes the identity of that area. I really. <laughs> Well, yeah, whether whether Shawnee can be on there, but I, I think we need to capture that that Parks and Rec, that Valley of Champion. Um, yeah, I agree. You don't, you don't I want Lenexa on there. <laughs> no. Yeah, I agree with you. I oh boy, here we go. Um, I like the the concept of the Valley of Champions as well. And I polled some residents just on my social media today, and they all seem to be really receptive to taking advantage of all the youth sports that's happening there and doing some kind of a cool mural if it's local art or otherwise. So, Lindsay, I just want to second what those have said about the sports theme. I think that works great. I think that's perfect for the area. I prefer that over the name Shawnee because I agree I don't necessarily want to burden staff with calls about that being our water tower, questions about water. I like the general sports theme. Jim? Um, I'll just jump in here. I, I echo the same thing. I think I think uh, and looking forward is, you know, Valley of Champions is uh, we got to start conceptually and going forward. Um, but it is an idea that I think if it's there and people see it and they buy into it starting now as we go forward, it will be um, a much easier thing for them to accept and promote and go because, uh, you know, that area, like I say, even, even though when the uh, landfill is done and uh, reverse the parks and rec, I'll be 100, but uh, that's a whole other story. But I think it's a good idea. I like the idea of the um, Valley of Champions. Okay. Oh, wait, you up in a wheelchair. Yeah, Eric. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any problem with the Valley of Champions concept. That sounds great. It'll, it'll look nice up there. I'm just concerned about if we had to pay a bunch of extra money to get that. I mean, we've been living without a water tower out there at all for quite some time. I don't think it's really all that necessary to put a, a mural out there about sports and stuff. If uh, Water One would be comfortable with doing that for us and it would be just you know thanks for letting us put our water tower here we're going to paint that for you and they can put anything on these guys want i'd be perfectly happy with that but uh i am concerned about the cost and it's, if it's gonna be you know twenty thousand dollars to paint that on there or thirty thousand i don't know this this kind of stuff's pretty expensive it's hard to hire painters to go up there 110 feet and and do this kind of stuff so um i'm just concerned about cost that's all i would like to try to not spend money on just pictures on the water tower no one. <clears throat> Doug and I can follow up. I'll kind of echo what, what Doug said. I think as long as it's kind of a more of a standard type of look, I don't know that there's going to be an increased cost. We'll, we'll reach out to Water One and confirm that. And then just to let you know, I, I gave Bridget about an hour's worth of notice for her to come up with that sports theme. So appreciate <laughs> her yeah, work. And, and she sent that over to So it's just kind of, a, it's yeah. just a kind of, Bridget sure. just kind of came up with that concept. Just, so appreciate the quick work just, on that. But just kind of giving you guys that idea for kind of a sports theme with that. And just follow up when you do that. Um, just see if there's a difference i mean okay if you just put shawnee good starts here it would, we would do it for free if you do this it could have cost you x number of dollars or they both cost the same thing we don't really care what you put on there it's all going to be the same because we don't have that kind of information right now and I, that would probably be very useful yeah i think that would be helpful moving forward I, I i agree that we have not had a water tower and my preference would be that we did not have a water tower uh, <laughs> i hate it uh but i think because it is an eyesore right now if there's something we can do to maybe make it less so i think that would be wonderful and i think mickey and then lisa uh i still i still like the idea of putting shawnee on this you know when people are coming in through town on 435 Lenex has got their name spread out over there, and as people start coming up, you know, and you, we bring in Valley of Champions, great, and we, we do some, some stuff and we're going to start promoting it. We've got a great big area right there that we're trying to get developed. Let's let people know that we're in Shawnee. You know, they, they don't, it's, there's a line here of Kansas City, Kansas, and the next thing they see right now is Lenexa. They don't know the difference. 
So I think we need to we need to at least keep a name up on it. So we keep us on the map. Lisa. Um, I would be in favor of doing a mural even if there was a cost attached to it. And let me explain why. Um, back to Stephanie's point about the fact that I, these water towers are sort of inherently an eyesore. And we haven't had one here before. It's been open landscape. It's been, you could see the rolling countryside of the landfill. And um, now, now we have this wonderful opportunity to create what would become a landmark something that is it projects what Shawnee's image is this is not something to cheap out on this is something that you have to invest in our image needs to be invested so that we can attract developers so we can attract citizens um I, I think this is really important now do I want to go crazy no and do we want to look at designs and see if there are designs that are less expensive and if they're achieving the same goal then that's great absolutely but this is an opportunity that I don't want us to miss Jim. I believe somewhere I heard in the conversation is uh, this is the kind of thing when they build the bowl, they build the bowl and then they set it on top or something. So it has to be painted when it's on the ground. Is that correct? As far as I don't know when they finish all of the painting, but yeah, the bowl will be at steel. The bowl will be built around the tube and then the whole thing will be jacked up into place. That's how they've built them before. Okay, so, them so one of the considerations is this might be something, this apparent would seem to be something that needs to be done sooner rather than later. It's not like they had a crane in this guy up there with a paintbrush. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Before we reach a consensus, is there any other discussion from the council before I open it up to the public? Okay. Anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? All right. Seeing none, it sounds like we have sort of a general consensus to head down the road of a Valley of Champions sports uh, theme. I think we're all there. I think the one question is whether or not we put the name Shawnee on the on the uh, mural as well. So, Jim, yeah, sure. Maybe one with yeah. and one without. Yeah, that works for me. Yes, as we go forward, this general consensus, I think there were some comments made that we were looking for some information prior to actually doing any kind yeah, of Yeah, and, so. and this will have to go to council before, I assume, or, yeah. Yeah, because yep. I, I am concerned about the cost. I've already said that, so I'm not going to say it again, but it's just, it is significant. And we have to make ends meet, too, guys. Yep, I think this is just to move it forward to council so we will have all that information for a final decision. Yep. So if there is a consensus, I would accept a motion on that. Yeah, so, yeah. Second. Uh, I think that's close. Does that, it, yeah. <laughs> if no one's send good it, with it, I'll be good it with staff, it, too. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to pursue the Valley of Champions right. and get some, get some pricing information yes. Yes. for final review. That was that Matt was your said. motion, and I That's what you, that was your motion, and I'm seconding yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Okay. The second item is to discuss traffic calming. Traffic calming is an approach used to slow traffic in areas where high high vehicle speeds are undesirable. Staff will present an overview of traffic calming techniques, approaches, and costs. Transportation Manager Kevin Manning will make a presentation. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Once again, uh, my name is Kevin Manning. I'm the Transportation Manager for the city. And, uh, you know, with a lot of developments, but one in particular recently, there's a lot of discussion about traffic calming, um, what we should do, and just wanted to take the opportunity tonight to talk a little bit about current city policy, kind of my philosophy a little bit. And then I'm going to walk through a little bit about what I'll kind of call it appropriate speed for type of roadway and kind of how speed limits are set. So much of, of traffic calming and what people perceive as safe and unsafe revolves around speed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of philosophically um, how I approach that and, and what's appropriate based on what type of roadway. I'll go through a variety of different um, traffic calming options and the costs associated with them. I'll talk a little bit about what some other cities in Johnson County have done. I know we always kind of like to see what some of our uh, counterparts have done around Johnson County. So I'll give you some of their experiences and uh, pros and cons there. And then I'll talk a little bit about if you know if we were interested in doing something like this, how would we rank locations? You know, what would we really be looking for? 
So just to kind of define traffic calming, um, I kind of put this as the implementation of engineering, education, and or enforcement measures that reduce the negative effects of motor vehicles in residential areas. So basically our current policy um, is focused on education and enforcement. The engineering aspect is basically constructing physical features that would go on a roadway. Uh, we've never had a dedicated funding source for that or really approach that with the council, so uh, we haven't done a lot of that. I'm um, on the education side, you know, if I get complaints about speeding or, or issues with unsafe driving conditions in residential areas, you know, I'll try to work with an HOA or some kind of neighborhood organization to get that information out. Because uh, it's not, it's some, a lot of times it's the perception that people outside the neighbors are speeding, but the vast majority of the time it's vehicles going home, you know, in residential areas. So we like to communicate with uh, HOAs or other neighborhood groups first and just say, hey, you know, we've had some concerns about speeding, just be aware and uh, please drive safely. Uh, I also work very closely with the police department and uh, traffic sergeant Walsh. And uh, it's very common if we receive a speed complaint to go out there and set a speed trailer that will collect data over the course of a week. And then based on that data, the police department will kind of make a decision on enforcement, um, whether or not, you know, it's justified to have someone go out there. So we do, I mean, we spend a lot of time collecting data and looking at that. We don't really take just a shotgun approach. We try to be focused on, you know, we, we have limited resources, obviously, in the police department, and we want to make sure that if we do need to do enforcement, we're doing it at the locations that really need it. So uh, once again, traffic calming really revolves around speed. And I kind of wanted to present a little bit of a dichotomy here. This first picture is, is obviously a highway. And when you're driving on a highway, based on the characteristics of the roadway, most of the time it feels very comfortable to travel at a high speed. You can be driving down I-70, 75 miles an hour, and just feel like you're just cruising, you know, like, you know, it's, it's wide open, and you have big medians. Um, and so, it, you know, it, based on the roadway characteristics, that affects how people drive. It's, it's kind of the point that I'm trying to make. As you go into more of an urban section and <clears throat> there's more traffic, maybe you have barrier walls, you don't have as wide of medians, shoulders, then the speed limits typically drop and people feel less comfortable driving at a higher rate of speed. So similar to this, as, as you go into more of a downtown setting, and, uh, you know, like Neiman under construction, there's a lot going on. There's cones everywhere. There's a lot of driveways, ins and outs, people working. It's not comfortable to drive at a high speed. So really the roadway characteristics, how the roadway is built, how wide the lanes are, how far away from the roadway the buildings are, how many pedestrians are, are there on a the road. Um, that all that has a major impact as to how comfortable people are driving certain speeds. And that, that's really the <clears throat> defining characteristic or defining factor as to how fast people drive on roadways. So taking those kind of the highway versus the downtown area, I wanted to apply that to the residential area. So here we've got one of our city streets. Um, as you can see, I mean, the houses are set back. There's not a lot of parking on the road. You can see, you know, a fair distance off the roadway. It's a pretty straight shot. Um, people may feel a little more comfortable driving at a higher rate of speed uh, through this based on the characteristics of the roadway. They have plenty of sight distance. Well, here's another section. So this is an area where we've got, um, we've got townhouses. There's parking on both sides. Um, there's a lot of driveways, so you're more, you know, there's more residences, there's more likely to have people coming in and out. And so, you know, these are, these, these two roadways have the same speed limit, but how people drive, if we, we went out and clicked that on these two locations, your average speed on this first ro roadway here would probably be anywhere from three to five miles an hour more than this roadway because the roadway characteristics are different. So um, kind of moving on to traffic calming, um, kind of the different options that are out there. I'm going to kind of cover horizontal deflection, vertical, and then a narrowing of the roadway section. I've got about seven different options here. I'll go through here briefly, so just bear with me, and I'll talk a little bit about costs. And just keep in mind, I'm, uh, this, I'm not up here advocating necessarily for any one of these, either pro or against. Um, these are just kind of presenting options and, and see what you guys think. So starting off with horizontal deflection, this is essentially kind of like a, a mini roundabout concept um, that you'll see. And this was a, a test location that Oakland Park actually did, but it's basically kind of a little island in the center of the roadway. The radius of this island can vary, so you can make it smaller or bigger. And it just is essentially a device in the roadway that kind of forces people to go around. And, and the idea is you want to slow people down a little bit. Um, as I've discussed before, you know, a potential negative of this is it's, it's another obstacle in the roadway. You know, people can hit it, they can tear it up, they can run over that sign, you have to go over and maintain it. So 
that's all things to keep in mind. And the cost there is about five to thirty thousand, depending on what kind of materials you use, you know, how large it is. There's there's a the, the cost ranges you're going to see here sometimes are a little larger because they can really vary based on the scope of the project. Staying on horizontal deflection, these are chicanes. You can see there's a kind of a little series of, of these. And these are really intended to kind of be a little bulb out on the side of the roadway to kind of force a vehicle into kind of an S or a serpentine uh, movement as they're going down the road. So once again, just like uh, in the mini roundabout, you can make these small for a small deflection or you can really swing them out and make people made a, make a significant movement, kind of an S movement as they're going down the road. And these can be anywhere from $3,000 to $8,000 each. And here's an example of a median island. I don't, I don't believe this picture's from around here, unfortunately. So, <laughs> I like wish. Ten, yeah. ten degrees <laughs> out. So, uh, yeah, I would love I would love to be where this picture's at right now, but that's not the case. But you know, there was some discussion recently on these uh, types of features on Kansas State. Estates. So Lenexa does have some of these, but once again, this is just horizontal deflection. So you're putting something in the middle of the roadway and you're forcing people to kind of pay attention and kind of go to the outside. And these can cost anywhere from five to $15,000. So those are a few examples of horizontal deflection. Um, moving on to vertical. So this is by far the most common request I would say that I get you know, speed humps or speed bumps, some time type of you know bump in the roadway. Um, and then, you know, we've had discussions on these a little bit. So I think some of you may know my thoughts, but these are about three to $7,000. Um, and they can be a little bit higher than that too, if you've got a really long one. Um, but that that's kind of gets us in the ballpark. Uh, I've gotten, I wasn't able to get a good um, on-street photo here, but this is an example of a speed table. So this is over in Mission at Johnson Drive and Woodson. So some of you may have driven over this, but this is a speed table. So you can kind of see the lighter colored pavement here. That indicates an area that actually saw cut and it actually raises up all four directions. So as you're driving, basically the middle part of the intersection where the four crosswalks is, that is raised probably you know, anywhere from three to six inches above um, the roadway. So you go up and there's basically a flat surface on top and then you go down the other side. So, I mean, this one's uh, probably pretty pricey. Lee would put one of these in for about $100,000, um, pretty significant. You know, they had to do a lot of stormwater improvements as well to make sure they drain. But you'll also see more basic speed tables. Like let's say you just had a speed table just for the crosswalk. So it's the same concept. You would go up, the crosswalk area would be flat and then you would go down. So it's not a hump just kind of a flat area. And that's, you'd see um, the, kind of the lower cost there, more like $10,000 for one of those. But, um, and then kind of the final uh, approach would be to kind of uh, narrow the roadway in general. And so this first picture I have here, are, uh, what's called curb, curb extensions, or you also hear them called bulb outs. So you can see where these two pedestrians are walking. You can see the roadway is kind of narrowed there. So if you're trying to turn onto the roadway they're walking across, um, it kind of narrows down and then it expands out. And so um, basically the intent is if someone's driving down a roadway, you know, they have to focus a little bit more and maybe slow down as they kind of enter into an area like that and then the roadway opens up. But the entire concept there is creating the psychological um, effect of narrowness or closeness. Um, and another, a good example of this that I often use is, it, let's say you're driving down downtown, you're going down Broadway, um, there's buildings right next to you. They're, ver they're vertical. There's that, that feeling of tightness. Sometimes if there's a lot of on-street parking, you don't feel as comfortable as you would on more of an open highway. So once again, if you, if you kind of narrow the roadway, narrow like the building setbacks, things like that, that creates that effect of narrowness and, and people generally slow down for that. This is another similar example of what I would call roadway narrowing. So here your, your roadway is the typical section is probably similar to what we have, but you can see the sidewalks are on the back of curve. But the big difference here is that the building setbacks are dramatically reduced. This is a neighborhood in North Kansas City. And so um, you know, you'll see this in, in a, a few different areas, but by, by narrowing those uh, building setbacks, that pushes the buildings in closer and creates kind of a tighter feel. Generally, people will drive at a slower speed. If this is something we were interested in, I just wanted to put this as a caveat. I mean. This would involve some extensive discussions with our community development staff. Uh, I've talked to Doug Allman about this a little bit. So you know, he is aware that I'm talking about this tonight. And I'm not, once again, I'm not advocating for or against, but there would be plenty of things that would have to go into this um, policy-wide before we were ever really ready to move forward with something like this. So 
Um, those are just some options that we, you know, we can kind of look at or some approaches that we would take. Next, I wanted to talk a little bit about what some of our neighboring cities have done. First of all, Nexa, they do have a traffic calming policy and they have a citizen request process. They do not allow any vertical deflection. So no speed humps, no tables, that's out basically right off the bat. In order for anything to be installed, theoretically they need um, approval or buy-in from 67% of affected properties. So they, they want a lot of buy-in. They don't want to put this in with 51%. They want broad community support. And they, they don't do any funding for basically one-off projects. Um, any, any requested devices would need to be funded by developers, the HOA, or individual property owners. And as a result, they, they've actually never had um, kind of a standalone, like as part of their citizen request process, they've never installed anything. Because usually there's one or two people that are interested, and they find out they're essentially paying for it as opposed to the city, and then it kind of dies out. They do have a dozen or so devices citywide, traffic calming features. They've all been installed on basically city projects. So the city comes along, does a project. Maybe there's some residents that are interested. They put something as a part of that project. But in terms of their actual traffic calming policy, they haven't actually installed anything yet. Overland Park has had uh, their policy in place for a little bit longer. They actually did a test program back in 20, uh, or 2005 on 139th Street and 149th Street. They basically went out and did a bunch of different uh, temporary measures tried out a few things. Um, at the end of the project, they basically um, got some survey data. Uh, at 139th Street, about 60, 56% would be in favor of additional traffic calming measures and 44% were opposed. So uh, a little, you know, a little over half were in favor. But in terms of the impact on the overall neighborhood, 40% uh, had a pot, thought that traffic calming features had a positive impact and 57% had a negative impact. And they basically attributed that, that people didn't like the, the features that were used. You know, I went through several options. People thought maybe there were some better options out there, but they didn't really like what was installed. On 149th Street, you know, the story is a little different. They actually had about 60% that were opposed to what Overland Park actually did out there on a temporary basis, about 40% for. And uh, in terms of the impact on, on the neighborhood, it was, um, once again, fairly negative, 56% negative, 30% positive, and 14% no comment. So, Basically, after Overland Park got done uh, with these projects, there just wasn't a lot of broad community support. So they basically pulled all those temporary measures and they really haven't done, uh, or they didn't put back any permanent measures at that point. They did adopt an official policy in 2008. Um, it has a similar process to Lenexa for citizen requests. Sim also similar to Lenexa, they haven't actually installed anything per citizen requests. They've had a few devices they've installed um, on their SIP program, which is similar to like our Flint Street project that just got done. A project they do similar to that, they, they haven't installed a few devices. So um, those are two of the cities I've, I've talked to on this quite a bit. I know that Prairie Village has quite a few uh, speed humps. And I've, I've, I went through and uh, looked at like their citizen um, satisfaction survey, and there seems to be a little bit more broad support over there. Um, I went through and read a lot of the comments, and it seemed to be about 75% of the comments I read were saying that, you know, we wanted you know, we'd like more, and then maybe 25% were saying either they didn't want them, or another common thing to keep in mind is that, um, let's say you put a speed hump on one street, sometimes that would just move people over to the adjacent street. So that's that's obviously something we'd have to take into consideration. Are we really solving a problem, or are we moving the problem somewhere else? So, mm -hmm. so um, if, you know, if we wanted to move forward to some kind of a traffic calming um, approach or system, you know, we want to. We basically want to come up with several different ranking measures to make sure you know we're putting these in a location that really needs it. These are a few factors that we look at. Obviously, speed. We want to look at the existing speed limit. How much of a deviation are we seeing? It's pretty common in residential areas to see the 85th percentile, maybe at like you know 30 miles an hour. So that doesn't really. That's not really an outlier for us. If we start seeing 33, 34, 35 miles an hour, then that starts to become more of an outlier. It's more of a concern. Obviously, crashes, if we have an existing crash issue, that's something we really want to be aware of. By and large, the, the challenge for me on a lot of these, and we talked about this in part of Kenneth Estates, we don't have a lot of existing crash patterns on residential streets. And there's, a, I mean, one, there's just not a lot of traffic out there. It's, it's easy to go out to Shawnee Mission Parkway in Quivira where there's 90,000 vehicles every day. That means there's a million vehicles, um, you know, about, what, 11 days? So. That gives you a lot of data. When there's a million vehicles going through an intersection every 11 days, that's a lot of potential for crashes. How long does it take for a million vehicles to go through your average, average residential street? Maybe several years. 
And so there's just not as many vehicles going through them, as many potential for crashes for us to really get a good look at the data and say, oh, there's really an issue here. Traffic volume would also come into play in this, of course, uh, whether or not we had sidewalks. If we have kids walking in the road, that's a little bit more of a concern as opposed to if there's sidewalks that are five feet off the roadway. And they would also take into account any emergency vehicle routes. And then if we had any future plan, plan improvements in that area, if you know, it's, it's a lot more cost effective if we can throw one of these items into our project as opposed to mobilizing a contractor and having them come out to do a one-off little, uh, little bit of work for us. So I hope that kind of give you an idea of um, kind of what the city's current approach is, some options that we have, and kind of how we would approach that if we wanted to make that a bigger part of public work. So I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Matt. Yeah, a good presentation, Kevin. Uh, great information, so thank you. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had a constituent in here uh, requesting speed bumps, either speed table or whatever, and he made a comment that, that these were not issues for snow plows. And being that we've seen a lot of snow plow activity lately, <laughs> I was curious. I, I find that hard to believe. What's the impact of the vertical, uh, of the speed bump on Yeah, that? I mean, theoretically, when you're designing these, it should be... Um, they can be designed so it's you know it's gentle so you hopefully you're not getting a snowplow cut on a, you know caught on a lip right but on flat roadways there's there's pavement deterioration and that's how we see a lot of potholes it's, the snowplow can you know there's a little bit of pavement that comes up an inch and the snowplow hits it so even on a flat roadway right you know you're going to see some deterioration when you have a lot of snow and you know the pavement expands and contracts right so i would not say it's accurate to say that it's not a concern they can be designed to help mitigate that as best as possible Right, it's still going to be a problem. Yes. Right, and you bring up a, another solution you didn't met, mention. A good, a good uh, speed control method is just let the roads go to heck and potholes, <laughs> and that'll take care of it. Gravel does a great job slowing down speed. Yeah. Yes, right. <laughs> that is true. I'm not advocating for that, of course. But. <laughs> it's a cost-cutting measure. Yep. Indeed. <laughs> is there any other discussion by the council? Yeah, Eric. Yeah, just some comments. Um, this is a subject I heard a lot about when I was going door to door. People talk about people speeding through their neighborhoods and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the problem is it isn't that easy to solve. Um, I like the idea of the, them paying for it. That, that, that would probably make most of that go away when they find out, <laughs> oh, my God, that's going to cause me to pass the hat and get $10,000. So that would probably solve some of that. Um, the other thing, though, while, I, while you're here, I just want to ask another question because I remember one time um, – driving down through Texas, and I'd probably been awake for about 20 hours driving straight, and nasty rainstorm. And uh, on the highway, it was very dark, because it was raining and all this kind of stuff, very dark. And where I wanted to kiss the engineer to put those markings along the side of the road where you could tell where the roadway was, you could, you could find the road. And I, I sometimes find myself driving down here in Shawnee, and some of these medians and stuff like that, if it's a really crappy night with a lot of rain it's really dreary and stuff you can't see these some of, where some of these islands come out you can't really see that curb and what i was wondering i was going to bring that up someday when i had a chance to say hey is there any way we could kind of use some of that reflective stuff where it, it wouldn't be an eyesore during the daytime but it does have a tendency to reflect um you know the car beams at night or something like that because i don't know I, i've felt several times about ready to wind up in the med one of these mediums somewhere yeah there's actually um you know, that's something we, we keep an eye on. We haven't done a lot of installations. There's basically like basically reflect, reflective strips that you can put on signposts, and you may have seen those around. We don't have a lot of them here, but um, they're basically made of the same material that signs are made out, so they're extremely reflective. You know, they're fairly high quality. They, they get dirty over time, but they, you know, they're pretty stark and can help delineate those meetings. So that's median, so that's certainly something we can look at. Yeah, especially I don't know if you have any of those Texas highways, but it was fantastic. Yeah. You just see, boy, you could just see it. It's like, you see, you know, as far as your headlights could go, you see where the road was, and boy, that was that was fantastic. And you know, maybe it's my issue. I don't know, because um, as you get older, you get issues with that kind of stuff, so night driving and things as well. So you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's just my issue, but um, I don't think so. Because I still had that issue a little more even back then. So it might be worse now. But it's, Eric, just don't go to Texas. Just don't go to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, that was good in Texas. That's, that's a, we're trying to transfer some of that um, some of that thought process up here, maybe. Um, but yeah, just in certain, certain uh, some of these medians where the, you're driving down the median actually comes out into the lane. So I didn't really like those ones where you're suggesting, not suggesting, but just presenting some options there with the, yep. uh, the narrowing and the bowing out and stuff. I think that's just asking for trouble. So people are going to run over those and 
poor old snowplow driver's got to figure out what you know we got to be veering around these things too so that you know we talked about that as part of Kenneth Estates. it's really the, the kind of the tough balancing act because as, as I had kind of mentioned before some of those things can deflect vehicles and they can help sl slow vehicles down but you have to understand there's still an obstacle in the roadway and so you know is that something we want to put out there it may make sense in certain situations if we're having other issues and we say okay that basically the risk is worth the reward but that's always my personal challenge is if we, we don't have any crash history in the location, we don't have any, we don't speed that indicating an issue. Do I want to go out and put something in the middle of the road where that someone can potentially run over? That's yeah. I think sometimes process. reminding people might be good because I know yet the sign there it says your speed is such and such. And, yep. you know, I think that kind of stuff just kind of gives a little bit of a jolt. I know if I'm out driving, I, am I really? And look down at the speedometer, yeah, I guess I am, you know, and it just kind of makes you more in tune. And that's, that's something we can do without doing a lot of modifications and instruction and all that stuff. Okay, Lisa. Um, so I've been on the council almost four months now, and there have been two situations where we were presented with um, some really compelling arguments for citizens that want traffic calming measures. Um, one was for a planned development, and they said this is already going to be paid for. And then another one actually came up in mine and Stephanie's ward where they were experiencing um, unusual commercial traffic because of um, where they were they were located and we worked with the businesses in that case and I think that I haven't heard anything else so that's good but um, I did get the sense that the council and you were we were kind of afloat in our analysis we didn't really have anything to turn to to say well this is this is how we are going to approach these requests systematically so when you say that Overland Park and Lenexa have a policy whether they've actually had to implement or use that policy very often, I think it would at least help to have a policy to either say, we're going to do this or we're not going to do this, and um, here are the criteria if we are going to do it. I, I do kind of like the idea that the citizens would have to vote, that if there's going to be any um, uh, engineering involved, that they would have to pay for it. I like those ideas, but... I, I also want to defer to your expertise. So if you think that this policy is a total waste of time, then I'd like to understand why. Well, so yeah, I mean, right now we have a, a policy, it's fairly brief and it basically omits the engineering portion. I would say that I am, I am certainly open um, to some of these options, not all of them, but some of them, if, if we can demonstrate kind of a need. The issue for me is that a lot of times maybe my criteria is to that the bar that we need to be crossed is higher than the vast majority of situations. But I mean, that's certainly something we can you know talk about and, and develop more like what what would help cross that bar and define that a little bit more for residents. Any other discussion from the council? Looks like Jim, yep. Uh, so would it be appropriate just to ask, um, <clears throat> we have a policy which is evidently a little brief, but just ask for staff to come up with, maybe expand on that um and like sort of like what like Lisa said sort of that so our policy is a little more definitive for those people that want to look at it in, in the policy section so they have an idea just sort of to um, <laughs> sort of like hurting cats no. <laughs> but um, but just just to so it's there it's a policy it gives us a little something more to go on based on your expertise and the others with staff so that uh, citizens would have an idea. Yeah, some, some, I mean, it's speaking in general terms there, but just make a little more definitive. Yeah, it sounds like that would that would be appropriate based on from what I'm hearing tonight, for sure. Yeah. And Nolan, is that, I know we talked at staff for a council retreat a while ago that you guys have a pretty full docket um, for the rest of the year in terms of policies and projects you all are looking at. I, is there bandwidth for that immediately, or is this something that we kind of... Let me circle it, Kevin. Okay. I, can, I mean, just may not come out to you next month, but we can kind of put it on the plate and see if we can kind of start Okay, great. Any other council discussion? All right, anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? All right, thank you, Kevin. I don't think you probably need an official motion, but 
accepting the direction. This item was for informational plus purposes only tonight uh, and concludes our agenda. I will accept a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Motion has been made and seconded on this item. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion passes. We are adjourned at 745.